So welcome to What is Civic Engagement? Exploring New Paradigms. Today's webinar will examine the history of civic engagement in the United States, present novel findings from the most robust longitudinal survey about civic engagement trends in the United States, and explore local level views of the myriad of ways people are engaging in civic life outside of formal institutional context. There'll be plenty of time at the conclusion of the presentations to ask our panelists your questions. Please be sure to place advanced questions in the chat. We'll be collecting your questions for the Q&A time block towards the end of the webinar. And now, here to welcome us and set the stage for the discussion is Dr. Andrea Robles, Research and Evaluation Manager with the AmeriCorps Office of Research and Evaluation. Hey, okay. thank you, Katie. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I first wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And as always, we are just thrilled that there's so much interest in this topic. And I see the chat uh, of all of you joining from uh, all over the country and in other countries, so fantastic. We believe civic life is essential to a thriving democracy and our speakers will be presenting very interesting findings and studies on where we find ourselves as a nation in terms of civic life and some reasons for that. As Katie said, we hope that during the Q&A, we have a vibrant conversation that include your ideas as well of how we can reignite civic life. And this is of particular interest to us as an agency, since we are very well aware that as a nation, we are still recovering from the impacts of the COVID epidemic. As an Office of Research and Evaluation, we have several ways we support our mission of increasing civic engagement and volunteering to strengthen communities. So next slide, please. As you will see on your screen, we categorize the work into four main buckets. We identify national service and volunteering trends at different geographic levels and with different populations. We conduct research and build scholarship on civic engagement. We measure national service impacts and provide technical assistance for AmeriCorps grantees conducting evaluations. And we promote evidence-based models that have been evaluated to be effective in meeting program goals. As an office and agency, we work really hard at translating this knowledge and evidence so that information can be utilized to strengthen organizations and communities, improve our program, and enhance our members and volunteer service experience. Our webinar series is just one way that we make our evidence available. Today, our speakers will be addressing these first two buckets that are shaded in blue. But before I turn this over to our distinguished speakers, I want to very briefly describe the development of this work at AmeriCorps. So next slide, please. So in 2002, we partnered with the US Census to field a supplement on volunteering in the current population survey, otherwise known as the CPS, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Dr. Laura Hansen Schlachter will describe the work in more detail in a few minutes. But just in terms of background, after about a decade of fielding the supplement, we started to wonder whether there were more ways to measure the concept of civic engagement or civic life more broadly. For example, after a decade of fielding the supplement, regardless of the year and context, the formal volunteering rate was always around 26.2 nationally or, some, or something close to that. So we started asking ourselves, were we using the correct measures? Were we missing questions that better tap into volunteering and civic engagement behavior and attitudes? So with these questions in mind, we turned to the National Academies of Sciences to conduct a scan of the literature, review our questions and measures, and make recommendations on how we can improve our understanding of civic engagement, social cohesion, and social capital. Next slide, please. There were many wonderful recommendations and you can download a free copy of this report and uh, it, there should be a link in the chat. But one major recommendation was to complement the national level survey with other studies that could allow us to tap into more complex relationships among these related topics. More specifically, NAS recommended that we conduct research at the subnational and local levels and second, use other research designs such as in-depth longitudinal or experimental studies. So to address these recommendations, our office developed a research grant competition for scholars and graduate students at universities so they could conduct more innovative research on these topics. To make sure we incorporated local level research as well, we also created a research grant program called the Community Conversations 
that focus solely on scholars and communities conducting participatory research or action research in communities. So to learn more about these awardees and their studies, again, um, there should be a link in the chat. You can find it on our website. So more importantly, it's uh, that all three speakers that you will hear from today are research grant recipients. So next slide, please. So our first speaker is Dr. Laura Hansen Schlachter, who is currently a research analyst at the Office of Research and Evaluation at AmeriCorps, and is the technical lead of the CPS Volunteering and Civic Engagement Supplement. She is also a 2017 awardee. Our second speaker is Dr. K. Kawashima Ginsberg, who is the new house director at the Center for Information of Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, also known as CIRCLE, at Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University, and she is a 2015 awardee. Our third speaker is Penn Lowe, Associate Chair, Senior Lecturer, and Director of the Master of Public Policy Program and Community Practice at Tufts University, University's Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning, and he is a 2018 and 2022 a grantee. Again, please, if you have any comments, questions, great ideas, please engage and um, just put those ideas in the chat. So Laura, I am handing this over to you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that wonderful framing and welcome everyone. We're really glad to have you with us today. Um, so next slide, please. So I'd like to begin just with a question for you all. Civic engagement is a term we throw around a lot, but there's no universally accepted definition. So I'd like to ask you to do a quick exercise. Um, if you'll humor me, close your eyes and picture engaging in civic life. Who do you see? What are they doing? What's the first thing that pops into your head? And I'll invite you if you feel so inclined to just share that in the chat. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about civic engagement? Okay, I see voting, voters, collective action, volunteering, voting, public meeting, everyone participates, no, neighbors helping neighbors. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, and keep them coming. Yeah, so as I suspected, voting is one of the top things that come through in this, uh, that I'm seeing coming through in this crowd. I see some volunteering, and I also see a wide range of other things that people can do to participate in civic life. Um, and you know, historically at AmeriCorps, as Andrea said, we have really focused on formal volunteering through organizations. Um, voting has been of less central focus for our agency, but certainly top of mind for scholars. A recent report by the Institute for Citizen Scholars found that researchers repeatedly turned to voting as the key indicator of civic readiness. But if you take one thing away from this webinar, I hope it is the idea that civic life takes many forms. Yes, absolutely, it encompasses voting and volunteering and national service, but civic life also involves behaviors like reading the news, buying socially responsible products, and even pursuing careers in public service. Uh, next slide, please. What these behaviors all share in common is that they're all activities individuals engage in to make a difference in their communities. Now, notice that we in the AmeriCorps Office of Research and Evaluation define civic engagement in very behavioral terms. In part, this reflects our agency's focus on getting things done for America. And in part, it reflects the fact that a lot of our research around civic engagement trends across the country leverage behavioral indicators, which are much more reliable and easier to measure through national surveys than, say, for example, we focused on values or ideals. Um, but obviously those also play a role. And part of what we wanna do today is invite you to a dialogue about what civic engagement means in the context of your work and your community. So I'd like to kick off that conversation by sharing with you a bit about how we operationalize our definition of civic engagement through the most robust national survey we have about the multitude of ways that people engage in civic life across the United States and over time. Um, next slide, please. It's called the Current Population Survey Civic Engagement and Volunteering Supplement, or CEV. So really reflecting this idea that civic engagement takes many forms, in total, the CEV includes measures of 17 different civic behaviors that I group into six key constructs, organizational engagement, informal helping and conversation, local collective action, engaging, engaging with issues, economic engagement, and political engagement. And in January, we rolled out top line findings related to organizational engagement and informal helping and conversation, 
through our volunteering and civic life in America research. And today I wanna to share with you some insights related to these other areas of civic life. Um, but first, just a bit about the history of the CEV and how you can access and explore this data yourself. Um, next slide, please. Following 9-11, there was a renewed interest in more systematically studying civic engagement in America. And as Andrea mentioned, AmeriCorps entered an agreement with the US Census Bureau to conduct a nationally representative survey about volunteerism attached to the current population survey or CPS, which has been our source of federal labor force statistics since the 1940s. Um, as she explained, the first volunteering supplement was fielded in 2002, but over time, this idea of tracking a broader conception of civic health really gained traction. And in 2008, AmeriCorps be also began to sponsor a CPS supplement encompassing what scholars like Ben Berger have described as the political, social, moral, and civil dimensions of civic engagement that have a lot of important implications for social cohesion and social capital. And taken together, these two CPS supplements included many different indicators of civic engagement, um, but also some redundancies. And so in 2014, the National Academy of Sciences published a report that AmeriCorps had commissioned from experts in the field. And as Andrea said, some of their recommendations focused on collecting different types of data, different methodologies. They also recommended merging these supplements, a process that resulted in the launch of the CEV in 2017. In other words, for the past two decades, in one form or another, AmeriCorps and the U.S. Census Bureau have conducted the most robust national surveys on civic engagement and volunteering trends in the general population. And we're really proud to be part of a collaboration that produces this rich data source. And you can access the full CEV data set from 2017, 19, and 21, along with complete documentation at data.americorps.gov. That said, of course, the CEV is not the end all be all. Um, it does, but it does give us a bird's eye view of some key indicators of civic engagement trends. Um, next slide, please. So I want to share some of the most interesting things I've learned as I've explored the 2021 CEV data. And my goal today is to convey, again, civic engagement takes many forms, including and beyond voting or volunteering through organizations. And also that the CEV is a valuable resource that we as researchers and practitioners have to examine the state of civic engagement in America. In order to understand where we want to go, we need to understand where we are. And so I'll slice some top line findings in three different ways. First, in terms of prevalence. Second, in terms of change from 2019 to 2021 at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And third, in terms of variation based on where people live and who they are. Um, and this is only going to scratch the surface, but I hope it piques your interest and encourages you to explore the data yourself. So. What types of civic engagement were most prevalent in 2021? Um, next slide, please. The graph here shows the national rate of each measure we have in the CEV. The rate indicates the estimated share of the general population that engaged in each behavior at least once in the previous year. So as you can see here, <clears throat> between September 2020 and September 2021, over two thirds of Americans talked to or spent time with friends or family, read, watched, or listened to news or information about political, societal, or local issues, discussed political, societal, or local issues with friends or family, um, and had a conversation or spent time with their neighbors. Now, these are not necessarily the first things that come to mind when we think about civic engagement, as we saw in the chat, um, but they're all, they all build social cohesion, trust, and knowledge about the public sphere, and thus we can see them as building blocks of participation in civil society. Um, next slide, please. And I think what's interesting is that these ways of engaging with issues or people close to us are common, both in terms of whether people are do them at all or not, and also in terms of frequency. Um, it just so happens that these top four measures also, we also ask in the CEV how often people engage in those behaviors. Um, and you can see in the graph here that um, in many cases, a substantial percentage of Americans do these things at least a few times a week. Um, so, for example, 83% of Americans learned about issues through the news in 2021, but almost half did so almost every day. So these are common behaviors, both in terms of prevalence um, nationally and in terms of frequency. All right, next slide, please. So just going back to our frequency graph, what types of civic engagement were least common in 2021? And as you can see here, less than 10% of Americans contacted or visited a public official to express their opinion, donated more than $25 to a political organization, party, or campaign, 
or attended a public meeting such as a zoning or school board meeting to discuss a local issue. And I saw that's something that came up in the chat. Um, and these are all what I would consider to be higher effort forms of civic engagement, but also ones that are really crucial to the functioning of our democracy. All right, next slide, please. All right, so next, how did civic engagement change during the pandemic? Now, in this context, I consider a substantial change to be within two percentage points, plus or minus. Obviously, you can operationalize that in different ways, but some small fluctuation is expected year to year. And I think this threshold captures changes that we should you know, it should really make us sit up and take notice. Um, and the story here, next slide please, is actually that the overarching pattern is one of stability. As you can see here, the change in rates of all CEV measures of informal helping and conversation, engaging with issues, and two of our three measures of political engagement actually stayed within two percentage points between 2019 and 2021. Um, next slide please. Now, um, if you participated in our rollout event in January, you know that we did see a historic decline in the formal volunteering rate. That's the rate of volunteering through organizations. This seven percentage point decrease is the largest drop we've seen on record um, since we began collecting this data in 2002. Um, and it's the largest change we see of any CEV measure um, in terms of absolute value. We also see substantial decreases in other measures of organizational engagement and local collective action. Um, in contrast, buying or boycotting products or services based on the political values or business practices of a company substantially increased, as well as voting in the last local elections. Um, and I suspect this is tied to unprecedented turnout in the 2020 election that trickled down the ballot. Um, next slide, please. So here's a visual comparing rates of organizational engagement and local collective action in 2019 and 21. Um, and as you can see here, the baselines for these more in-person, higher effort forms of local collective action are much lower. Um, I'm guessing it's no surprise to many of you on this call that we saw declines in forms of civic engagement that have traditionally taken place in person. So I think the question here is whether this will be a temporary dip or represents broader shifts in the sector and how we can respond. Uh, next slide, please. But again, to me, the most striking takeaway here is the stability of informal helping and conversation, engaging with issues, political engagement, and economic engagement. Even in the midst of a pandemic that upended just about every aspect of social life, Americans continued to help and engage with each other informally about issues and participate in the democratic process, at least at the national level. Um, next slide, please. Now, the story is a little bit more complicated when we look at variation in state level rates. In some cases, stability, stability at the national level mirrors what we see at the state level. Um, so for example, next slide please, um, the rate of contacting public officials went down only 0.4 percentage points nationally from 2019 to 21, not what I would consider a substantial change. Um, but we saw relative stability within two percentage points in the rate of contacting public officials in 41 states and a substantial increase or decrease in the state level rate in only 10. In other cases, next slide please, um, stability in national rates kind of masks substantial variation in the extent of change at the state level. For example, the rate of posting views about issues online went up only 1.8 percentage points nationally, a real, but, you know, a real change, but not necessarily a substantial one. But at the state level, it did go up substantially in 22 states, down substantially in 12, and then was relatively stable in 17. So we see a lot more variation at the state level that isn't necessarily captured in those national statistics. All right, next slide, please. Um, so that's just a little teaser about geography. Um, what do we see in terms of um, demographic patterns? Now, the relationship between education and civic engagement has been well documented in terms of formal volunteering and voting. As Wilson and Music write in their 2008 book, Volunteers, A Social Profile, Quote, education is the most consistent and often the strongest predictor of volunteering. But there's been much less research on the relationship between education and other forms of civic engagement. Um, next slide, please. But one of the most consistent patterns I see across every CEV measure in terms of demographics is a nearly linear relationship between civic engagement rates and educational attainment. For example, this graph shows national rates of talking with neighbors, learning about issues, and values-based buying or boycotting by education. And as you can see, there's a pretty stark difference between those at the top levels of educational attainment and those at the bottom. Now, the typical approach in, among researchers is simply to control for education and statistical models and not think much more about it, but I think this actually raises a lot of important questions about why we see these trends. 
Now, many scholars have conceptualized education as a resource that enables individuals to more easily afford the costs of giving time um, to participate in society. They've also theorized that education builds self-confidence and more expansive and heterogeneous social networks, which increases the chances that people will be asked to participate. So the question is, do these mechanisms extend to other forms of civic engagement? Um, are there opportunities for us to ask and to reach out to people who historically have not been um, quite as um, invited at, at such high rates um, to participate in these other forms of civic life? I think there's really a lot more to dig into here in terms of mechanisms and implications for inequality. All right, next slide, please. Now let's just take little look at gender. Um, in terms of prevalence, we see comparable rates of women and men engaging in civic life along most measures in the CEB. Um, there is a gender, a slight gender gap in uh, terms of formal volunteering, charitable giving, talking with friends and family weekly, and volunteering or giving through an employer, um, with women typically having slightly higher rates than men. Um, next slide. Um, but we see, and we see a similar pattern in terms of changes in civic engagement rates between men and women during the pandemic. Um, they're largely similar. The one exception to this is rates of volunteering through organizations, which decline much more substantially for women and men. Um, and while this makes sense in the broader context of evidence about the burden COVID placed on women, for me, it raises also interesting questions about why we see disproportionate impacts by gender for formal volunteering, but not for these other types of civic engagement behaviors. All right, next slide, please. Now, the third demographic pattern that really struck me is related to age. Overall, measures in the CEV either increase more or less linearly with age or resemble more of a bell curve with rates gradually increasing with each age group and then declining among those 80 years or older. Um, next slide, please. For example, you can see here that rates of charitable giving and talking with neighbors increases pretty steadily with age and then drops off slightly between ages 80 and 85. Um, contacting public officials here in red looks more like a bell curve with less than 8% of those under 24 and over 80 engaging in this type of civic behavior. Next slide, please. And we see a similar pattern with other measures, um, for example, with engaging with issues. Um, next slide, please. Um, so you can see here learning about issues, discussing them with friends and family, discussing them with neighbors. They all follow the same pattern most measures, as most measures in the CEB. Rates more or less steadily increase with each generational cohort, and then there's a slight drop off among members of the silent generation or older. Um, but notice we see the opposite pattern with the rate of posting views about social issues on the internet or social media. About a quarter of members of Gen Z and millennials engaged in this type of civic behavior at least once in the past year, compared to only 17% of baby boomers and 11% of the silent generation or older. And I know that Kay is gonna dig into civic engagement trends by generation a lot more, but again, I think this raises some really important questions related to measurement and also thinking about policies that can support or erode civic infrastructure for the next generation. Um, so I'll just end with a couple thoughts about implications of these findings. Um, next slide, please. As I said at the outset, if you take one thing away from this presentation, I hope it's the idea that civic engagement takes many forms. Although volunteering, voting might be some of the first things that come to mind, there are a variety of ways that people make a difference in their communities. And the CEV is of course not exhaustive. There are many measures of civic engagement it leaves out as Kay and Penn will discuss, um, but it is a really rich data source that allows us to examine some of these key indicators over time um, we'll be publishing a comprehensive report about all of these measures um, in the coming months. I encourage you to check it out and let us know what you think. And thinking about these trends is really important for our agency. Part of AmeriCorps' mission is to foster civic engagement through volunteering and service. How can we leverage our platform and resources to reignite civic life? As people who are interested in national service and community well-being, how can these um, findings inform our efforts to engage different groups in making a difference in their communities? How can we meet people where they are? And taking a closer look at America's civic health over time and the multiplicity of ways people contribute to society is also important to us as a country. In the original Latin, the construction means together build. How can we collectively and constructively rise to the challenges of this moment? Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Kay Kawashima-Ginsmer. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Laura. It was a wonderful presentation. And hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kay Kawashima Ginsberg. I'm so glad to be here as someone who cares deeply about young people, civic engagement and democratic engagement, as well as a member of AmeriCorps family as a 2015 grantee. So thank you for having me. Let's go to the next slide. I'm here to talk about what, um, from a place that Laura left us with, which was the engagement that young people demonstrate with regards to discussion of issues with family, friends, neighbors online. And this is an interesting measure in that for young people, this is the measure that they excel at in many ways. Um, they're rising in other metrics too, as I'll indicate later, but this is one measure where they surpass other generations in terms of the rates on their own. And when we ask young people more questions about why, how, and what they do with this online discussion, we get a much bigger and richer understanding of how they're engaging in civic life and how they view their place in democracy. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of that. Let's go to the next slide. So the first piece of data I want to share with you is a teenager data that we collected for age 14 and 17 year old Americans back in 2020. And we asked um, about the civic and political engagement among this age cohort, because we were starting to see that instead of just looking at 18 to 29 as youth, we were starting to see 12, 13 and 14 year old and a little bit older youth getting really involved in civic and political life and expressing their voice, particularly online, because that's where they could actually access as opposed to having to drive somewhere, for example, um, to be a part of a protest or going to the state house if they lived in somewhere that's far away from a location where they could do those things. So we saw a large number, about 45% of young people sharing views, using a variety of medias. And some of these things that young people expressing themselves with regards to political views are probably not the kind of ways people have typically expressed themselves. So they're making memes, they're making gifts, they are sharing their experiences with their own civic engagement instead of telling them to do something. But there, for example, um, if they're 18 year old, they're filling out their voter registration form on a TikTok and showing everybody that's how that's do it. So that their peers are learning along with them how they can be a first time voters and filling out these government forms correctly. Um, there are many states where student ID laws are really confusing to many young people. So many young people stepped up to make videos or online pictures or infographic in many cases to show how it's done. So that's how they're starting to use online media as not just a way to discuss issues, but educate each other, encourage each other, and share diverse types of experience they have. Let's go to the next slide here too. So there's also staying informed as part of civic engagement. And it's a really important part of civic readiness as all of us probably agree with that. Um, but when we take a look at how young people, particularly even within young people, Gen Z's and millennials access information from a variety of sources, you see some differences between older adults and youth. Um, here we're showing both kind of people that can translate, filter, and mediate information and share political affairs and public affair information with young people. So that's family, teachers, classmates, and school as well as some forms of media that could be print media, podcast, um, and mail. And you see by and large, young people relying on the people that are close and that they know well and social media to get information about public affairs. On the other hand, things like print media and podcast are way down on the list. I think radio and TV are sometimes sources, but they didn't blip as kind of a way that they primarily get information us. Um, again, we see some differences in the kinds of media they use, um, even within social media. So older young people tend to use Facebook a lot more than younger Gen, uh, Gen Z's. And Gen Z's tend to use more of the visual media, like TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and so on. So that's the trend there. And let's go to the next slide here. And I think the uh, if you could share the information about all the studies that are listing all these data, that'd be great. I think I share that in advance. Um, so one of the things that's important to know about young people and news and information consumption is that the young people can be the important mediator between the complex and sometimes confusing information and civic and political action. 
research consistently show that the young people need that space to be able to process information with somebody, try to understand it, and decide what they think and do about it. So that mediation role is taken up by a lot of young leaders who are taking that role to share that information and experiences through the media that is accessible and relevant for young people. In addition to that, we see more young people of color using these visual medias to be able to share the political views with others. And what it may be doing is really filling out this important gap and abyss in some of the legacy media in the voice, views, and experiences and assets of young people of color that are not represented in the media and those young people stepping up again to represent themselves so that other people like themselves see each other in the media. They feel that their stories, diverse stories that come from communities of color um, and the other communities that are historically marginalized can be represented in an accurate way. So it's playing that equalizing role as well, as well as mobilization. So moving away for a minute um, from uh, just online engagement and how widely they use this particular word online engagement to do sharing information, mobilizing action, learn about issues and convince others, I'm gonna now switch gears to talk about how else young people are engaging in today's civic political life. So if you can move two slides. Thank you. I'm showing how young people's involvement in social movements has been on the rise. So it really peaked, and this is all from our semi-annual surveys um, in 2020, but it has been much higher than we had seen in previous several decades. So the rate of young people who are aged 18 to 24, who said they had participated in demonstration or marches in support of social issues have risen from kind of a baseline rate in 2016 survey to 16%, peaking at 27%, and then back down to 14. It ranges a bit. And as you'll see, this may have a lot to do with how many opportunities are available for young people to participate in these protests, but large percent, well more than half of the young people today continue to say they are part of a movement. They consider themselves as part of their identity. They support and something about the movement that they support, whether it's a gun violence prevention or it could be climate action or racism in their community and police violence, but they see themselves as part of these social change that are happening. And I often get questions about, well, when young people engaged in so-called activism, do they stop voting? Do they stop keeping up with public affairs? Do they stop doing anything else? That kind of turns out to be not true at all. So, um, Movement involvement is connected to virtually all forms of civic engagement. And I'm highlighting some of the voting and registration related metrics here. We see that the young people who say they are part of the social movement is 21 points more likely to say that they're voted and 22 percentage points more likely to try to convince friends and family to vote. So they're really getting at these really active and engaged young people who are now taking on sizable role in our civic life to do a lot of things to move the community and especially informing and encouraging peers. Let's go to the next slide here. We have some interesting data from during the pandemic that I want to share with you. And it's particularly related to how CEB asks questions about helping neighbors, family, um, and friends. And what may be happening with the young people that's interesting is that the young people were in fact doing a lot of things to help, but oftentimes they were locating strangers on the internet that they didn't know about, but they heard there was a need, whether it was a food aid or the money they could donate through GoFundMe or some other little formal informal ways um, or deliver food or make masks and send it to the distribution center. These are the things that young people are doing in relatively large numbers during the COVID-19 pandemic at the height of it. And then even more young people are saying they would do those things if they had opportunities. So there's an interesting potential gap in thinking about how young people find and locate community needs without being totally grounded within their local community, knowing neighbors per se, but still being able to mobilize themselves to support the people they don't even know, but know that they need something. And that was really evident uh, during the pandemic when we're collecting data. 
Now, a little bit of challenging news in the next slide coming directly from the most recent AmeriCorps data is a decline in volunteering rate and still relatively low rate of informal helping in the 18 to 24 year old age bracket. As you all know, the data collection starts for 16 and 17 year old and then all the way to an older age group. And what you see is a notable dip in the formal volunteering rate with 18 to 24 year old. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, namely, and most probably most important one is a lack of institution supported formal opportunities to become engaged in organizations. So if you think about the age group before this, they're often living with family members in the family origin neighborhood and going to school. And they're sometimes, you know, offered opportunities for service learning for credit or coursework. Sometimes they have family members who might strongly encourage their teenage kids to go do service in their community with them and often can drive them or have them a way to get to a place where they want to do service work. On the other hand, 18 to 24 year old represents really a transitional time period in a lot of young people's life where they're moving very often, if not every year, they're sometimes living in a new community, oftentimes detached from their family of origin for the first time. So these opportunities are now missing in their lives. And so that explains part of their dip in volunteering rate. The other side of uh, potential motivation side that we're starting to see is that the young people are really looking critically at the society and how to find themselves in civic life. So sometimes they may be choosing to become engaged in political activities instead of engaging with organizations and thinking of doing service as not so much a social change activities but supporting community more and more young people are really looking to um, become mobilized for social action. And that's what we're seeing in the uprising in, uh, or uptick trends in the protests and movement involvement. But potential downside of that for the young adults is that they're having to choose because of the time commitment. Um, but I think the lack of institution supported formal opportunities is really the largest factor in driving this debt. But what's clear is that the this age group in particular needs a lot more support. If we were to engage them fully in service, uh, particularly through formal organizations. Okay, continuing with that data, let's look at the next slide, which is coming from our most recent survey in 2022, post-election. And we're seeing similar trends in the political action too, not just in service. So we see pretty high rate of young people, you know, joining um, petition or boycott and boycott, and then following candidate on social media. Those are kind of a low time commitment activities. And then much less frequently, young people are able to, for example, volunteer for a political campaign, attend pre-protest or run for office. But much bigger bar, especially for run for office, which had 2% of young people saying they've done this, is the people that are interested in doing so, if they had opportunities or planning to do so. With run for office, there are 13% of young people who said they would run for office if they had opportunities. We had a separate study about running for office in particular because of this kind of increase in interest that we were seeing among young people and found that especially for young people who come from mid to low income background and communities of color, um, lack of network with wealthy people was one of the biggest barriers for running for office. Not the lack of capacity, not a lack of experience or intent um, for good governance, but it was really structural barriers, economic in nature. But there's a lot of hope in seeing young people wanting to do more, contribute more to the community through their action and power. If we can go to the next slide, um, here's one of the things that I want to communicate, in addition to showing there are some challenges, is that the vast majority of this generation of young people believe that their generation is the generation that can change things for the better for the country with systemic change through collective action. And their generation, Gen Z in particular, is a generation, unlike other generations we've watched, like millennials and Gen Xers, are much more willing to engage directly with political institution, whether it's voting, running for office, registering for voters, and shifting policies through organizing and protesting. 
whereas other generations have maybe shifted more towards starting a nonprofit organization or mentoring young people or coaching sports leagues in their communities to support their community and kind of seeing politics as totally ineffective and not worth engaging. And that's at least what surveys used to show. This generation really doesn't say that. This is a generation that says that they have some questions about how things are going in our democracy, but they're willing to stick around and try to fix it with us. And that is the next slide that I wanted to show with you, which is that the young people are not confident about how democracy is going right now. And only a quarter of young people agree with that statement. But when you ask them, is democracy capable of creating those changes? Half of young people agree and only 13% of young people disagree with that statement. And to me, that says a lot about how young people are critical, cynical um, about how things are going today in our American democracy, but why they're sticking around to keep pushing the public officials, keep voting, keep organizing, and keep sharing information, because they have this hope that they can do this, they can change for the better. So if you can go to next slide, I want to use the last few minutes to share about the building blocks um, for civic readiness. So at Circle, we care a lot about how young people grow up to be citizens, mostly um, in the community. And we see educational community institutions, as well as family and neighborhood as a really important systems to build that readiness by doing all sorts of help. So the first one I highlight is in the next slide, which is information literacy. So media literacy education can be done in school or community, but especially in school, it's really one place where young people at scale can learn about sourcing, evaluating, synthesizing, and creating media and news. And young people are show, uh, showing really desperate uh, access, depending on where they live. So rural young people, black young people, young people whose parents do not have college experience are particularly at risk. But even overall, all young people, about half of them report having sufficient media literacy education while they're in school. So it's not nearly enough, but especially problematic in some communities. Next slide I show is um, what we call uh, civic desert, which is really a physical condition where young people say that they don't really have access to multiple institutions, whether it's a preschool for their own kids or civic institution, arts and humanity organizations or religious institution, they don't see themselves being able to access those institutions where civic life can happen in diverse ways. What we found is that when young people say that they don't have access to those places or just one or none of these places, um, they also show both low civic engagement and political engagement, but even more so, they lack belief in the power of the collective. When young people band together and try to solve problems, these people that are living in low access to institution places are far less likely to believe that we can change public policies together. And that's again, leaves a lot of thoughts for me about how do we make sure that the environments and the communities can offer a variety of opportunities where young people have voice and practice civic life well before they turn 18. And the next slide shows the lack of knowledge um, that are happening in many, many communities within the K-12 uh, community. So foundational civic knowledge empowers young people to know where to go, who to go to, how to communicate, and what they can do in a particular situation when a community sees a problem that they need to solve. And that's really important base knowledge that you need to have. And by the time kids reach eighth grade, we see a significant disparities in the rate of proficiency. So this isn't just a test at code NAEP that is about memorizing facts, but it also has questions about leveraging foundational knowledge to solve a particular applied problems. And when you look at it this way, we see um, children who are coming from low income household with less educated parents reaching proficiency level at less than 10%, while at the upper strata of the society, um, higher income and more educated parents, almost 40% reach that proficiency. So already by eighth grade, we're seeing huge disparities in where kids are starting out and continue to see disparities moving into the older age. I want to go to the last slide here to show you um, some of the trends that are happening in the K-12 education. There are some really great opportunities like uh, 
big increase in federal funding to support civic education and social studies education, including American history, uh, lots of great activities in extracurricular student associations, as well as after school program. I think many of you represent those organizations where great innovations are happening, where young people are doing hands-on civics in their community. And some of the fields, stakeholders are starting to really come together to talk about how comprehensively and holistically we need to think about that education. At the same time, there's lots of threats and challenges in that the public really lacks understanding still about why it's so important to start building civic muscles and let kids use it from early on, especially from schooling. And many, many state legislative actions are taken or proposed to limit the amount of experiential learning, like service learning that can be happening within the community. Um, and many limits on the kinds of books the kids can read in the library, the kinds of history content that students and teachers can talk about in an open and pluralistic way within their classroom. And that's giving teachers a lot of fear and having chilling effect on what they think they can do in their own classroom, whether it's a social studies teachers or not. So I'll leave you here with this opportunity and challenge picture. Um, and next slide, it will just have my contact information if you have any further question. And with that, I'm going to pass on to my wonderful colleague, Pen Lo. Thanks. All right, thank you, Kay. I've learned so much about uh, what's going on at the broader national scale from you and from Laura. And uh, my role here today is to help us zoom in. Um, so I have been teaching uh, at Tufts in this Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning for about 13 years. But for the 13 years before that, I was with a community-based environmental justice organization. Um, including having a youth program there, doing some of the things that Kay was mentioning. Uh, but my focus has been on community university partnerships and action research to advance more sustainable, just, and democratic communities. And I had the privilege of uh, being in AmeriCorps' uh, first community action research grantee group in 2018 and, and continuing on with the 2022 cohort. So if I can go to the next slide, uh, the one after that. Great. So I'm going to be talking a bit about some of these changes and that, that involved challenges and opportunities for civic engagement in a very specific place during the pandemic. Um, the AmeriCorps grant uh, from 2018 supported the work that I did with eight community-based organizations in the Boston area where we focused on learning about and sharing reflections on how the pandemic affected uh, civic engagement. And you can see the report that came out of that, uh, the, the front page here, grounded and interconnected in the pandemic. And uh, all of these groups that we worked with and uh, who were part of the research, uh, doing the research, not just being studied, uh, they all served working class communities in greater Boston area that had high concentrations of immigrants and people of color. And while these communities may have high needs, they have also been hotbeds of diverse forms of civic engagement, uh, the multiple forms that Laura was talking about. And uh, for our work, we see civic engagement as being inclusive of of, of a number of categories that have already been mentioned, but uh, we break it down into advocacy and organizing, community building, and mutual aid, uh, which we saw uh, take off in a very particular way during the pandemic. And so for today, I'm gonna be sharing some of the findings that we had from this study, and I'll finish with some of the questions that we're continuing to pursue uh, about um, how some of these uh, opportunities and innovations that happened during the pandemic might be sustained into the future. All right, so I'm just going to go right into our first case, and if I can get the next slide. Great, so I noticed some of you are from New England or Massachusetts, but if you aren't, uh, Chelsea is a small city in Massachusetts that it has about 40,000 people. It is uh, mostly immigrants, majority Latinx. 
Uh, as you can imagine, lots of frontline low wage workers. Uh, housing is at a crisis level actually in the whole region, but overcrowding, uh, also overburdened by pollution. And so all of these set up uh, conditions that made it so that Chelsea was one of the hardest, actually they were just off the scales at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, highest rates uh, in Massachusetts. Um, but if you check back a year plus later, uh, they had achieved some of the highest rates of vaccination amongst working class immigrant communities in the US. And uh, we will learn a little bit about how that happened, if I can get to the next slide. So several of the community-based organizations uh, really catalyzed civic action and collaboration far beyond um, what they had done before. Uh, the week before the COVID shutdown, which was almost three years to the day from today, uh, a group called Green Roots, which was an environmental, they are an environmental justice organization, were the ones that convened a call with 15 stakeholders to begin coordinating emergency response uh, across community, uh, service providers, and government partners and hospitals. Um, that call continued every single day, including weekends for the next over two months, and became the Chelsea Pandemic Response Team that involved 75 people and 10 working groups. Um, this was the way that uh, collaboration across all the sectors um, happened in order for Chelsea to really respond to how hard they were hit and to start getting proactive about how they would respond. Um, so Green Roots and another group called La Collaborativa uh, were groups that were really connected on the ground with people. They sent health ambassadors out into the streets to meet people where they're at um, and to talk with folks in their own languages. Um, of course, Spanish being one of the major other languages besides English, but uh, the, they were also out there uh, with four other major languages uh, spoken in the city. Um, they were able to counter false information, particularly around vaccines when those first came out um, through person-to-person -person communication, um, but they also started to employ social media. They made their own TikTok videos to counter uh, some of what was uh, being perpetrated through, through other social media channels. And uh, all of that really led uh, to a response that is now being held up as a model for how a community and a city can respond. All right, so that's the first case. I'm gonna to go to the next one, if I can get the next slide. All right, so we found with all of our groups, all of the groups that I worked with uh, were primarily groups that did community organizing and advocacy and community building. Um, during the pandemic, or actually basically overnight, they all pivoted to do uh, direct aid which was something that uh, some of them did a little bit of, but that was not their primary purpose. Um, and of course, during the pandemic, uh, you know, reaching out to people, trying to figure out what they needed and trying to connect them with resources became one of the primary ways that uh, these community-based organizations uh, were doing their work. And I just want to share two stories about some of the innovations that happened uh, during the pandemic. Um, so a group called New England United for Justice that operates out of the Dorchester neighborhood in the city of Boston, uh, they developed something that they called their wellness to organizing model. Now they're an organization that in non-pandemic times uh, basically does door-to-door -door campaigns and they do a lot of outreach um, in neighborhoods. Pandemic prevented them from doing that. So what they did instead was start to conduct wellness checks through phone calls. And they made, in that first year, they made calls to 85,000 people holding more than 5,000 conversations. Uh, one of their leaders said, it's not just about getting the service. So if they reach, if they sign up for rental assistance, they hear about housing justice. If they're filing for unemployment, they hear about workers' rights and the struggles. This is a vehicle to continue our organizing. So for them, uh, the wellness checks and connecting to people to services really fit with their model of trying to build even more civic engagement by getting people involved in the various organizing and advocacy campaigns that they had ordinarily run. If I can go on to the next slide. 
Yeah, the other case I'm going to talk about is in East Boston, which is uh, actually right next to the city of Chelsea. Um, here, I'll start with the story of a group called Neighbors United for a Better East Boston. Uh, this was a group that also did a lot of civic engagement, um, get out the vote campaigns, and uh, a lot of grassroots outreach. Um, so when the pandemic started, they set up a system of block leaders uh, so that people could check on their neighbors. And how they brought people together was through the WhatsApp uh, chat uh, application. And uh, with over 300 people active, they found that they could actually use this network for mutual aid. And so uh, Neighbors United for a Better Boston, East Boston, working with uh, several other organizations, um, formed Mutual Aid Eastie. And uh, this became a major clearinghouse, Mutual Aid Eastie, for connecting people with abundance to share with people in need. Um, one of the major things that they did was uh, food delivery. And uh, during the height of the pandemic, they were delivering more than 5,000 meals per week. Um, and what's really interesting here is they were really concerned about the mutual in mutual aid. Uh, they tried to ensure reciprocity to overcome of what they called a culture of servicism, or some other people might call it a, a culture of kind of one-way charity. Uh, so all the participants who were part of this network were required to do an orientation to learn about you know, ways that they could contribute and receive. Um, and they signed up with WhatsApp because that's where uh, the, that chat was where people matched offers and needs. As one of the uh, leaders in this effort said, uh, we had to re redefine it as reciprocity and being in relationship with each other. It's saying, I have enough. Our folks say, I don't have anything to give yet. Our people were saying, I made tamales and I can get, sell them or give them. All right, so let me advance one more slide. Great, so um, some of my research partners and I were also involved in another related project for um, a climate justice funder in our area. And I just wanted to show this slide because it's a wonderful graphic that was produced from a webinar we did there. Um, but we were looking at how mutual aid during the pandemic was a foundation, building a foundation for climate resilience. And I should mention, we conceive that as a broad social resilience that could respond uh, to all kinds of impacts, not just for climate, but for pandemics and uh, other things that may yet to become. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to show this and um, say that, you know, a lot of the, the work that we're doing uh, shows how important civic engagement and civic infrastructure really is to uh, really to life and death uh, when we have uh, crises like the pandemic. Um, all right, and now I'm gonna go to my last slide, which is a few of the takeaways and some of the questions that we're now uh, pursuing. So one of the takeaways for us is that mutual aid is not new. Um, there are new forms of trying to promote it and to do it that came up during the pandemic, but certainly mutual aid, if you define it as people taking responsibility to care for one another and provide for material needs, then that's basically something that's been happening as, as long as human beings have <laughs> been around. Um, and uh, so what we were seeing was, was not entirely novel, um, but building on really uh, ancient practices. And um, second, the grassroots community-based organizations, uh, the, the kinds that we were working with in our project showed that they are a critical part of the civic infrastructure. And really during the pandemic, they started to be recognized by both government agencies, uh, by other uh, stakeholders as being that critical bridge that was able to connect the resources that were being made available to the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, and that was a big revelation because a lot of times these are smaller community organizations. A lot of times they have to really fight for recognition for the work that they actually do. And during the pandemic, uh, you know, folks were going to them saying, hey, how do we get to the folks um, and provide needed aid uh, to people who are the most vulnerable? And um, the stories I told really were about 
how they were finding new ways to exercise civic engagement um, and mutual aid being, I think, among the newer ways that they became involved in. Um, and that there were some real ways that the relationships that they had at, with government, with other uh, nonprofit service providers and private sector partners were really rewiring themselves um, to become more effective. And uh, that is now the promise and potential that we are starting to explore in the next phase of our project. Uh, we are started in this next phase, we are gonna go deeper into learning about uh, the experiences of the mutual aid networks and how those networks can sustain themselves and be strengthened going into the future as we are coming into a different phase of the pandemic. So one of the biggest questions we have is, you know, how can government and public resources support this type of reciprocal mutual aid that a lot of our community-based organizations have done? And uh, another question, of course, that I've already mentioned is that, you know, these groups are trying to figure out how do we sustain this stuff? We did all this stuff on an emergency basis. Um, how can we build this into uh, the day-to-day -day and regular activities that we do? All right, so I'm gonna stop there. And now it's my job to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, to Adrian Andrews, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff of AmeriCorps. Thanks. Thanks, Penn. And um, I have so many notes right now. I am sure many of you maybe have as many, maybe more than I do. And I just am incredibly grateful for this body of work. Um, I know uh, many of you know a lot of these things intuitively and also are engaged in some of this research. And uh, I told our research and evaluation team that sometimes I feel like we're we're sitting on a mountain of treasure and how do we share these stories and these pieces and these tools uh, with our network. So I'm so grateful uh, that we have this space. I'm also wishing we were together in person because I think the room would be buzzing with ideas. And so I hope we can continue to generate those ideas uh, in this meeting time and beyond. Um, and so uh, I'll introduce myself, uh, Adrian Andrews, Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, with a focus on strategic engagement. And um, I am new to the agency, but not new to the national service world. Um, so I recognize several of the names in the chat and admire a lot of you for the continued work you're doing uh, on, in communities around our country. Um, I actually wanted to anchor us a little bit um, in our personal stories uh, and um, Thinking about our journeys into the service space, um, all of you are somehow engaged in service and civic engagement and what that looks like. I appreciated, uh, Laura, your activity of viewing what that fabric of our community looks like. Um, for me, growing up, I, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, Rust Belt city uh, that got left behind uh, in, in, in the industrial uh, revolution there. We we're still trying to figure out um, what you do with a, a working class town uh, that doesn't have work to sustain families. And so I grew up in that moment where we were losing jobs and people, I think the, the unemployment rate was 13% when I was in high school. Um, and so really challenged in watching the, the resources and the institutions that we had known sh shift and, and be reshaped uh, because of our, our kind of um, lack of, of of resources. And so, um, so I was watching that as I was growing up and keenly aware for some reason of all the social stru structures that were being shifted in front of me and trying to figure out where I belonged in all of that. And I went to a high school, 80% of our folks uh, in my high school were under the poverty line and college was not uh, expected. And I was lucky to go to college. I, I had a uh, privilege that some of my peers didn't have and, uh, and, and worked hard, but also felt very lucky to have access to education. And I remember thinking as a kid and my best friend growing up reminded me that we define success as getting out, as leaving town, as, as finding uh, better horizons in other places. And so that was the framework I used when going to college and thinking about, wow, I'm gonna do going to move on, get my degree and do all these things. And um, as soon as I was able to have access to that education, I recognized that I needed to share it. So I had this resource education, this gift 
that so many of us know, how can I shave it, shade it, share it with the broader world? So that was kind of my look at what I saw service. I don't know that I would have named it civic engagement at that point uh, in the volunteering I did in my community. It was just you showed up for each other. And so I think I keep wrestling with these conversations we have around service and civic engagement and figuring out where the conversations are happening and how we make sure that we're a part of them as an agency and as a network with all of you. Um, and so uh, I spent many years working in a, in a, uh, a nonprofit focused on education um, and again, landed the agency. And I find that my role now is to translate some of these things that are happening up here in, in DC land and research land to the actionable pieces uh, that actually will, will move communities forward, the, the solutions to move communities forward. So um, for, for folks who don't know, uh, AmeriCorps is the federal agency on volunteering and service. Our mission statement is simple, yet very deep and complex. We, our mission is to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement through service and volunteering. Um, 30 years ago, they were very ambitious when they gave us this call and this task. And um, we do this through several streams of funding, grant making, obviously th through these research grants, um, we have Native Nations grants, VISTA grants, and then we also have volunteer generation fund grants and days of service, 9-11 and MLK Day, ways to put federal money quickly into local communities so that you all can uh, build programs and engage folks and use our, those resources to engage your community because we know it takes resources. So a couple of things I want to note in terms of uh, what I heard today and what I've experienced in my work and in my lifetime of service so far, I have many years to go, um, is this generational shift that's happening. When I'm thinking about the fabric of our communities and this patchwork that makes up of our, our communities, um, I heard some folks talk about what institution, institutions look like locally and how some of our young people are disengaged from those institutions because of distrust, mistrust, or different ways of communicating. And I think there is something noteworthy there that we have to collectively think about how are we reshaping institutions that were built for another period of time for another generation of people and then who are we preparing to be the leaders of those institutions um i i'll add this here because i think it's something that penn maybe realize right now is that there's an interesting moment here with the pandemic being hyper local folks were so ingrained in their community because they were kind of stuck there. And it, uh, something occurred to me when Penn was talking about how we build on that moment of helping people feel anchored in their community and not think that the, the definition of success is getting out of that community, that the definition of that success is uh, recreating those institutions and building them uh, for the next generation. Um, and I think uh, that would be an Excellent question for the group, uh, uh, for the Q&As to, to just really think about what that looks like for you all and, and for us as an agency. And in terms of uh, AmeriCorps, you know, we are also thinking about ways we can modernize service and reduce barriers to service. Um, I'll be fully transparent. When I chose to serve in AmeriCorps uh, many years ago, I thought I was making bank at, you know, $10,000 a year. Uh, you know, I, I could put my loans on hold. Um, that doesn't, it's not sufficient anymore and we need to do better and we need to make, the way I like to say it is give people the permission to choose service. So we need to think about modernizing the way we do that and we are making those requests and this administration has been very supportive and helping us figure out how to do that. Um, just see one more thing. Um, and the other thing I'll just say to for folks uh, new to the AmeriCorps network, um, we, this week we are also celebrating AmeriCorps week and um, check out all the social channels because there are so many, we're doing our best to capture the individual snapshots of impact. The impact that happens when people are engaged in their local community for local change and themselves learning how they can create a lifetime of service. Um, Another uh, notable uh, grant, I mentioned the Volunteer Generation Fund. There are several new uh, grants we're putting out there and uh, a colleague sent me one of these from Serve Utah 
and it's around community engagement pathways modeled after Stanford's uh, pathways of public service and civic engagement. And I think those kinds of snapshot grants and those opportunities to look at this on a micro level and see how we can make sure that we are giving resources to local folks who have local solutions to local challenges. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, I have a lot more to share with you all, but I know you all have things to share, ideas to share, and excited to engage with you in conversation. And again, thank you all for being here, for being a part of this network, and for uh, our research evaluation team for, for bringing all these people to the table. I'll turn it over to you, Melissa. All right, thank you so very much, Adrian. I have the honor and responsibility today um, of moderating the Q&A. Um, my name is Melissa Googe. I am an analyst in the Office of Research and Evaluation. I am very fortunate to work with, uh, work with and have worked with these grantees for a while. I'll get right into the Q&A. I have been collecting your questions from the chat, those that have not been answered. And I'll do a round robin. And um, again, if I don't get to your question, many, many apologies, but let's let's hit the ground running. This first question, I am going to direct to Penlo, if you could hop back on, please. Um, one of something that resonated with me as you were discussing um, this, this work and uh, mutual aid and the act of reciprocity, um, I think is really important. And it resonated because we hear our beloved CEO, Michael Smith, in nearly every presentation or every time we have an opportunity to interact with him, that AmeriCorps should be an, or, an organization, an agency where everybody should be able to serve and everybody should be able to be served. Um, so I think that 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 Part of reciprocity is, is really in the ether um, in our organization these days. But I want to ask you a question. Um, so one of our questions to you is um, the work that you are you were discussing, Penn, is in some ways feels like it's emerging from survival mode and moving into community, if you will, um, on your climate resilience slide in particular. Um, and what what has that looked like? Um, in the context of the case studies that you have shared. Um, how are folks adapting to a post-crisis moment, if you will? Yeah, no, thanks for that, Melissa. Um, lots to say on this. I, I would say first that uh, I wouldn't necessarily draw such a sharp contrast between survival and community. I think that it really goes together. The, Christ, the pandemic, I think, was a real good example where people step up right, when, when uh, there is need. And um, I think as, as Adrian said, you know, people are just there for each other. So, so I do think that the pandemic created more opportunity for that, even if we didn't like that that was happening um, and, and hope that it doesn't. But um, so, I, so I would say that's kind of the first response on, on that. Uh, the second, and this was very clear with our uh, group of eight uh, partners was that they particularly were feeling burned out. You know, you can only sustain some of this type of action for so long. Um, and if you're not resourced to do it, if you're, you know, I mean, they, they were just talking about being on, you know, 24 seven, right? They, they, could, they could never step away from uh, the roles that they were put in and the need was so great. And what they want to see as we move into a, you know, a, a post pandemic, but not return to normal, is that uh, you know, they wanna see some of our systems, our, our, you know, uh, whether that's through the social service providers, through our public resources, you know, really retool themselves so that we can do a better job should other crises like this come in the future. And uh, you know, so so more civic engagement required to do that as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Next question, I will direct to Laura Laura's Lochter, if you could hop back on. Um, we have a couple questions for you here. Um, do you, so did you see, this comes from Leslie L in the chat, were there any correlations between CEV changes in states 
and state COVID policies? Did you, have you done this analysis? Um, I love that question because you are <laughs> anticipating the next, one of our next steps in this, in our analytic plan. Um, I actually was in a conversation with Andrea that just this morning about this topic. Um, so when I look at the variation in state level rates, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and tackling that research question raises some thorny issues around how do you actually, like what's the right indicator of COVID impact? And so that's where we are now is looking at some possibilities, um, but that is analysis that's very much at the forefront of our minds and we will um, be sharing that out as we, as we conduct it and learn more. Right, thank you, Laura. And the next question I'll direct to Faye, if you could answer this question, please. Um, we have a couple, perhaps a couple for you here. When you were discussing different gener how different generations of young people hear about information, did that include, um, did the, the mail slide include email as well? Is this another avenue that you are considering? Great question. So we actually meant physical mail in this case, and there's an interesting kind of a dichotomy in kind of how young people really appreciate mail. They love it on one hand, but what I often hear is that they need to be told if it's like an official mail, like my city in Massachusetts need to census people every time we need to update our voter registration form. And then I had a younger coworker in the same state who missed that mailing um, because he didn't check it. So what I'm hearing is that you may need to also text those young people as a city or email them to sort of have a dual or a triple way of communicating with them and not rely on like one method and then assume that they would get that. So our question did not include email. In okay. Would you, while we have you, would you mind um, placing some of the findings you shared about general Generation Z in historical perspective? Um, have we seen similar trends? such as disengagement from traditional institutions, distrust of government, and during other periods, thinking maybe around the 1960s as a comparison? Right, so the closest parallel that we can track is sort of how the voting rate increases as people age. It's always linear and upward trend as people age. That's what's expected. What we're seeing in this generation of Gen Z is a couple of things. A, their, rating, you know, their voting rate is very similar to that of the Blue West generation when they were the youngest cohort. They had also shifted uh, constitutional amendment though. So they were sort of are very much on the high of being able to vote on the 18 year old. Another thing though, that may be notable with this generation is that they don't wait to be like older twenties to start voting. There's relatively small difference between 18 and 19 year olds voting rate and then slightly older 25 to 29 year olds, let's say, that gap has been shrinking um, as is midterm voting rate. They're, I think, higher on the trend, though this cohort just started voting as a generation in midterms. Okay. And thinking about, um, you were sharing information about formal volunteering as well. Is Was that data, did that, that include virtual or online volunteering or is that just in-person volunteering? So we didn't actually survey young people about volunteering. The CEV data is what I'm citing in the slide. So I'm gonna ask Laura to speak to that. Yeah, I can speak to that, thank you. Yeah, so our question about volunteering just asks if, if in the past 12 months, have you volunteered with or through an organization? Um, so that might very well be virtual, might very well include virtual volunteering. Um, we don't have a way in the CEB responses to assess what people are thinking when they answer that question. Um, but my assumption, and I think the general assumption is that that definitely includes um, volunteering virtually. Thank you, Laura. And I'll also offer, um, Carissa a, asked a couple of questions around virtual volunteering, and I will offer um, a little sneak peek that we have a new uh, FY22 uh, grantee at University of Maine, Dr. Jennifer Crittenden, who is doing a study on virtual volunteering um, in our AmeriCorps seniors program. So there will be information coming out around that in a couple of years. Uh, so please stay tuned. <laughs> we'll know more about virtual volunteering in particular when that comes out as well. So Laura, don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got another question um, from Jessica F in the chat. 
um, finding it really interesting that the data does show that generals, gen, <laughs> Generation Z, as being ranked lowest in civic engagement. But Points of Light's research shows that general, Generation Z's engagement is highest above all generations in volunteering and working in, in mm -hmm. ethical organizations. Um, so the only two civic actions that they came in last for them was donating. Um, which mm -hmm. kind of makes sense if you're uh, if you have limited discretionary income um, mm -hmm. and voting. So, do you have mm -hmm. any thoughts on this? So there are a couple possibilities there, and I'd be interested um, to see exactly which piece of their data in their report. Um, we actually have had the opportunity to collaborate with Points of Light on um, and the Virginia Service Commission to um, kind of better understand each other's. Um, measures of civic health and um, the Virginia Service Commission has been conducting some interesting research to kind of customize their definition and measurement of civic health to their state. Um, my understanding is that points of light, so a couple things are, first our samples are different, right? So um, the CPS really is the most robust. We have the largest, um, the highest response rate, um, you know, this is the source of our federal labor force statistics. And so in terms of generating reliable estimates, the CPS is, is my go-to. Um, that said, I think that there, part of the discrepancy might be um, just differences in measurement. So we have one very, when we cite the formal volunteering rate, that volunteering through organizations, our question really asks about that specifically. The way that the points of light questions are written um, could include volunteering formally through an organization or um, informally just kind of helping your neighbor. And in the CEV, we separate those out as two separate forms of volunteering. I don't know if that is exactly the statistic that you're referring to, um, but we've been having a lot of really good conversations with points of light. And I think this just comes down to the idea that again, civic life takes many forms. And there's ongoing conversation among scholars and researchers and practitioners about how we best capture that, right? And it goes back to what Andrea was saying about our research grants. You know, a survey is a survey is um, can be a very robust tool, but it is not the end all be all. And the way that people interpret questions can look very different, um, even based on one you know one a one word change. And so that's why we really need to use different methodologies and um, be really looking at sort of local level variation in order to understand not only the, the what, but also the why and how people are processing those questions and what the implications are for the overall findings. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for all of us in this space to continue to learn from each other. Yes, absolutely, Laura. Um, I'll pose this question to the, to the panel. Um, if you have any suggestions or questions um, directed to the whole panel, but in particular, Kay and Penn, if you have suggestions on how a formal organizations can entice young people to get involved. I'll go quickly. So Adrian, I was actually really glad to hear about the potential for our institution to shift. Um, and I think there's a lot of promise in including young people in particular in decision making about what the program is doing, how they're reaching out to young people, in what ways young people are actually participating in co governance of the particular institution. A lot of organizations are trying kind of intergenerational work. I think that can actually change the face of volunteering. I'll stop there. I'll just ditto that um, in the organization I was with, we had a youth program and when they took the reins and developed their own approaches and we provided resources then amazing things happened. All right, thank you so much, Penn. Well, it looks like we are at time today. So I'll thank you all so much for attending. This was fantastic. And as the slide says, um, in the next two weeks, you should get a recording and you'll also have all of the materials and um, in case you want to take another listen. Thank you. So we're now at the at the close of our webinar. We'd like to thank our research panelists for their presentations, Adrian Andrews for the American Reflection and Dr. Melissa Gooch for facilitating the discussion. To our audience today, our webinar objective was to provide insights into national trends about civic engagement, research into engagement with youth about civic engagement, and how new understandings of civic life are emerging through local mutual aid efforts. 
We hope we hit our mark and you join us for our next webinar in the Reigniting Civic Life series on April 26, 2023 from 3.30 to 4.45 Eastern Standard Time. I'd like to extend a thank you to our AmeriCorps staff, Mathematica, and the Guardians of Honor colleagues for their technical support and coordination. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.